Hey, what's up guys? It's Jonathan. And today I want to talk to you about the word pro. Now pro is short for professional and professional typically means to relate towards a profession or an occupation. Now, when you throw a pro on the end of anything, you automatically assume it's going to be well, better. Let's take the MacBook Pro, for example. The MacBook Pro has been pretty much an industry benchmark for a mobile workstation for years now. And recently gaming laptops have pretty much replaced our typical idea of a mobile workstation. And that's where this computer comes in. This is the Razer Blade Pro. And I wanna see how these two mobile workstations will what could be mobile workstations compare against each other. So first and foremost, let's talk about pricing. The MacBook Pro here is the 15 inch model, like I said, with touch bar, and it starts at $2,400 for the lowest end base model, but it goes all the way up to $4,300 if you max out everything. And over here, you have a $3,700 base model going all the way up to $4,500. In terms of specs, we're only gonna look at what we have in front of us. Now, in terms of going up a notch, the only way that these computers can be improved is with their SSD size. So you can put in as much money as you want to, but when it comes to the models that we're looking at today, the only thing that can increase whenever you're doing a custom configuration is the SSD size. Now, the 2016 MacBook Pro has 16 gigabytes of RAM, a 512 gigabyte SSD, at least this particular model, a four gigabyte Radeon Pro uh, GPU with Polaris graphics, and then you also have a 6920 um, HQ uh, i7 CPU, which is a quad core CPU clocked at 2.9 gigahertz. Now, the specs are incredible on this, don't get me wrong, but when you look at it compared to this guy, it's kind of like, what? The Razer Blade Pro here features a 512 gigabyte SSD done in a RAID 0 configuration, meaning that there's two M.2 SSDs inside this that are rated together to give you maximum speeds and storage, and they are user replaceable. It also features 32 gigabytes of RAM, the 6700HQ quad-core i7 CPU, which is clocked at 2.7 gigahertz, and then it has the GTX NVIDIA 1080 GPU, which is an eight gigabyte GPU inside this beast, and that is incredible. So when it comes to designing a laptop, you really can't get any better than a MacBook Pro. Apple really knows how to work their craftsmanship into all of their products. And the 2016 MacBook Pro is no exception, but the Razer Blade Pro and Razer products in general are right behind MacBooks when it comes to their build quality. Both of them feature an aluminum unibody design, but both of them have their own unique features that separate them from one another. But I have to say when it comes to actual cosmetics, the Razer Blade Pro just looks badass. I love the black, I love the green. The Space Gray model on the uh, MacBook Pro isn't bad, but uh, to me it's a, still a little bit boring. So I threw a skin on mine and you can see here I got a wood skin from Slick Wraps. It's really dope. They have a ton to choose from. So I definitely suggest you, um, if you wanna spice up your MacBook Pro or you know older generation MacBook Pro, check them out because they have a ton to choose from. But when it comes to portability of each of these, well, you can't beat the 2016 MacBook Pro. Coming in at 0.61 of an inch versus the 0.88 of an inch on the Razer Blade Pro, you really can see the difference in thickness between these two computers. But that doesn't mean the Razer Blade Pro is thick by any means when you take into consideration what it's got packed into it. It's got a GTX 1080 GPU. Now this is a desktop GPU inside this thin body. And we're gonna get into that a little bit more when it comes to benchmarks and real world testing, but that's still incredibly thin for the amount of power inside this machine. The Razer Blade Pro comes in at 7.8 pounds. So it's nearly double that of the MacBook Pro and you can definitely feel it. Whenever you're trying to pass it to say a friend or your spouse with one hand, it's really heavy. And when it's sitting on your lap, it can get uncomfortable over an extended period of time, making the MacBook Pro, again, much more portable and much more comfortable to use as a laptop. So let's talk about the IO on each of these laptops. And this is where the Razer Blade Pro truly shines and trumps the MacBook Pro in terms of modernism. Now, the Razer Blade Pro features three USB-C 3.0 ports, one USB-C Thunderbolt 3 port, an ethernet port, an SD card reader, yes, 
an SD card reader, something that should be on the MacBook Pro but is not. And it also has an HDMI 2.0 port. Switching things over to the MacBook Pro, you have four Thunderbolt 3 ports. And I understand that Thunderbolt 3 is the way of the future, but as of right here, right now, you have to hook up dongles and many different adapters in order to get the I.O. that is featured on the Razer Blade Pro. Plus, the Razer Blade Pro does feature a Thunderbolt 3 port, so you can still hook up external storage just like you can on the MacBook Pro, but you still get all of the I.O. ports that you need right here and right now. Okay, so let's talk about keyboard and trackpads. The Razer Blade Pro features the world's thinnest mechanical keyboard, and I actually really like it. It's gotten a lot of crap because of it not being a true mechanical keyboard style, but I really do dig uh, the clicking. I like the tactility of the keys, but this is my first mechanical keyboard, so that's probably why. The trackpad, though, did take some time to get used to because instead of it being centered uh, at the bottom of the keyboard, it's veered off to the right, which isn't really a bad thing. I mean, when you're sitting at your desktop, you tend to hold your mouse or your trackpad over to your right if you're right-handed, and for me, it's very natural. But I did find myself searching uh, the center bottom portion of the computer for the trackpad, and it wasn't there. You also get a scroll wheel, which is located right above the trackpad, and that can be customized using the Razer Synapse software, as well as many other keys. And you can also do uh, the backlighting, which each key has an individual LED um, behind it, so the backlighting is just off the chain with this computer. Uh, you can do tons of different effects, tons of different colors, you can customize each key individually if you like, and you can also customize the LED lighting around the trackpad. Another thing is the Razer Blade Pro uses Windows precision drivers for the trackpad, so the fluidity and the overall responsiveness of it is excellent. Plus the bottom left and right clickable buttons I found to be fine. I mean, I didn't have any issues using them. And overall, this has been one of the best trackpad experiences on a Windows device that I have personally used to date. Now switching things over to the 2016 MacBook Pro, you have a second generation butterfly keyboard. It's very loud. But I personally like the sound of it and I enjoy typing on this. I do wish the keys were a little bit deeper so that way whenever you press them you felt it more. But overall the keyboard experience on the 2016 MacBook Pro has been great. The trackpad is enormous. Like it's almost like a joke. Whenever you open it up for the first time and you see how big this thing is, you just laugh. I mean that's all you can do. And I didn't think that I was going to enjoy it as much as I do and the actual palm rejection is great. Now it does feature force touch, which is carried on from previous generations and it works great, but the only thing that I don't like about this trackpad is the sound. Like it sounds awful, like it's about to break whenever you just do a simple click. So I went into the settings and I disabled the click and I just did taps because it sounds that horrible. Now the touch bar is this year's standout feature when it comes to the MacBook Pro. Basically, it's a touch sensitive strip located right above the keyboard that changes based upon whatever it is you're doing or app that you're in on your computer. The idea sounds incredible. The implementation for Apple's own apps is poor though, including Final Cut Pro 10. I mean, to be honest, when it comes to the touch bar, it's quicker just to do things the way you have always done them in most cases. But it is really cool to be able to scrub through a YouTube video whenever you're in Safari, or to be able to use the touch bar with an app like DaVinci Resolve. When it comes to speaker quality, each of these computers kind of take a different route. The Razer Blade Pro has several software applications that allow you to tweak the sound coming out of the speakers, including the headphone jack with the Razer Synapse software or the surround sound application. But at the end of the day, I have to give it to the 2016 MacBook Pro. You have to hear it to believe it, but once you do, you'll learn to appreciate and respect the speakers found on the 2016 MacBook Pro. Okay, so let's talk about the displays on each of these computers. On the Razer Blade Pro, you have a 17.3 inch 4K touchscreen that is an IGZO panel, and it has a 100% Adobe RGB color gamma but not straight out of the box. You will have to calibrate the display, but once you do so, you can get that 100% Adobe RGB gamma plus 185% sRGB, which is freaking insane. By far the best display I have ever seen, not just on any laptop, but just 
display it in general. I mean, this thing is gorgeous. Colors are extremely vibrant and everything seems very, very accurate and incredibly sharp. Plus it does feature Nvidia G-Sync. So if you're a gamer and you use that kind of technology, it is there waiting to be used for you in the Razer Blade Pro. The MacBook Pro features a 15.4 inch 2880 by 1800 display with a wide color gamma, but it still needs to be calibrated out of the box. Once you do so, it's capable of getting roughly about 91% Adobe RGB and 100% sRGB, which still looks great, but it doesn't compete with the display found on the Razer Blade Pro. In terms of brightness, the Razer Blade Pro only gets to 304 nits compared to the 500 nits found on the 2016 MacBook Pro. So if you're the kind of person that likes to go outside, do some editing, uh, do some writing, the MacBook Pro is definitely a better choice. But in terms of just an overall beautiful experience, and if you're the kind of person that likes to use a touchscreen, the Razer Blade Pro is definitely where it's at. So let's talk about battery life on each of these beasts. The Razer Blade Pro features a 99 watt hour rechargeable lithium ion battery. And that is the largest size battery that is able to go on a plane legally. And it is a monster and it does give you some great performance. You're looking at between two and a half to three hours of raw performance. Now this isn't gaming, this is video editing, but I'm doing extensive video editing. So I don't find that to be that bad. When it comes to casual use, like browsing the web, typing in documents, watching a YouTube video or two, um, you, you can get about five hours. The Razer Blade Pro comes with a 250 watt power adapter, which is for the most part travel friendly. It's relatively thin and compact, but it does weigh quite a bit. One thing I don't like about the charging on the Razer Blade Pro or just the power in general is the proprietary system they use. So you have to use Razer's charger for the Razer Blade Pro, which you'll understand why I don't like that in just a minute. So let's talk about the MacBook Pro. The MacBook Pro has a 76 watt hour lithium polymer battery, which is able to give you roughly between two to two and a half hours of extreme use, and this includes video editing, and also about eight to nine hours of casual use. It ships with an 87 watt USB-C power adapter. And that's what I was talking about when I was referring to the proprietary system that's found on the Razer Blade Pro. With the MacBook Pro, I can charge this thing through a USB-C port on any of the four Thunderbolt 3 ports using an external battery pack, making the charging solution for this laptop invaluable. It doesn't matter if it has poor battery life, great battery life, whatever, because I can just throw in a few external battery packs into my backpack and boom, I have battery life for days. Okay, so finally we're getting into the testing and the raw performance of each of these laptops and I'm sure this is what you have been waiting for. But before we get into that, I do have a few important variables to go over that I need to make clear. Now first and foremost, the files that we're going to be editing, rendering, and exporting are located on an external SSD. That is the SanDisk 900 Extreme, which is two M.2 SSDs in RAID 0 configuration. Secondly, I will not be testing out Final Cut Pro 10 or Premiere. Why do you ask? Final Cut Pro 10 is only found on Mac OS. It's not able to be downloaded and used on Windows 10 because it's only optimized to run on Mac OS. To go along with that, Premiere Pro is not fully optimized for the new MacBook Pro and performance is not very good. Thirdly, I'll be using Resolve. The reason why I'll be using this program over the other two is the fact that Resolve utilizes the most out of the GPUs on each of these systems, plus it's optimized for either platform and it takes advantage of CUDA or OpenCL evenly. And lastly, I will not be doing any gaming on either one of these machines. Okay, so kicking this thing off with benchmark scores, we're gonna begin this thing with Geekbench. The Razer Blade Pro scored 3,842 on the single core and 11,499 on the multi-core. The MacBook Pro scored 4,331 on the single core and 13,483 on the multi-core. Moving right along, we're going to look at the Cinebench test. The Razer Blade Pro scored 91.12 frames per second using the GPU, and when it comes to the CPU, it had a score of 588. Moving on to the MacBook Pro, you have 85.35 frames per second using the GPU, and a score of 743 on the CPU. Jumping into the Valley benchmark test. The Razer Blade Pro scored 1,308 with an average frames per second of 31.3, and this was using a 3840 by 2160 resolution. 
Moving on to the MacBook Pro with a score of 1,237 and an average frames per second of 29.6, I did do a custom resolution of 3840 by 2160, but it doesn't look like it showed up when you're viewing the actual end results. And finally, checking out the SSD performance of each of these laptops. Beginning with the Razer Blade Pro, I use the Crystal Disk Mark with a 617 write and 2,654 read. Uh, speeds are really good, but jumping into the MacBook Pro, it dominates the Razer Blade Pro with a 1,850 write and 2,000 read. So finally, we've gotten to the DaVinci Resolve export test. Now for this test, we're going to be using 8K footage from the Epic W. It's 16 to one for the compression ratio, and we're exporting to a 4K H.264 file. The timeline is one minute and 28 seconds, and it has been lightly color graded. The Razer Blade Pro did this in seven minutes and eight seconds, and the MacBook Pro did it in four minutes and 52 seconds. Moving on to a DNX HR444 export, uh, the Razer Blade Pro did it in 6 minutes and 42 seconds, whereas the MacBook Pro took 7 minutes and 5 seconds. Spicing things up a little bit, we're still going to work with the 8K footage, still 16 to 1, but instead we're going to do a 3 minute and 8 second timeline, apply 4 transitions, and then some noise reduction. The H.264 4K export took the Razer Blade Pro 14 minutes and 46 seconds, whereas the MacBook Pro took 17 minutes and 57 seconds. For the DNX HR444 export, the Razer Blade Pro did it in 13 minutes and 24 seconds, whereas the MacBook Pro took 21 minutes and 40 seconds. Switching things up a little bit, now we're going to be working with C300 footage. Now this is 2K footage shot in 60 frames per second, but it is still 12-bit 444 footage. It consists of four clips and the timeline is only 14 seconds long. So first of all, we're going to export to a 4K H.264 file. The Razer Blade Pro did it in 47 seconds, whereas the MacBook Pro took one minute and 13 seconds. Switching things up to the DNX HR 4K export. This is still a 444 file. The Razer Blade Pro did it in one minute and two seconds, whereas the MacBook Pro took one minute and 11 seconds. Exporting that same exact timeline, except this time we're actually going to be compressing that 2K footage to a 1080p file. The H.264 took the Razer Blade Pro 48 seconds, whereas the MacBook Pro took 31 seconds. The DNX HR444 1080p export took the Razer Blade Pro 28 seconds and the MacBook Pro 37 seconds. So what are my final thoughts and conclusions? Well, when it comes down to most video editing, if you're not going to be doing extensive grading, applying heavy effects and mini transitions, the MacBook Pro is going to suit your needs perfectly. It's very portable, very lightweight, it can fit in any backpack, plus you can charge it from an external charger. But if you want desktop performance and you don't want any limitations to hold you back in terms of performance and still be able to maintain you know, somewhat fast export speeds, the Razer Blade Pro cannot be beat. I hope this video helped you make your purchasing decision when it comes to these two machines and let you have a better understanding of what they are capable of. As for me, I'm probably going to go with the MacBook Pro only because it's more portable and the fact that I can charge it with an external battery pack really means a lot to me. I do want the Razer Blade Pro, don't get me wrong, but for portability purposes, I just think that the 2016 MacBook Pro is a better option. If you guys enjoyed the video, drop me a thumbs up, subscribe for future content, follow me on all my social media platforms. Make sure you check out the giveaway that's going on because it's not really just a giveaway, it's giveaways. So you can find that in a little card right up here. Go ahead and click on it, follow the instructions from the Gleam link, and I will catch you in the next one. Be easy.